Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jean Lambert. I'm Green Party member of the European Parliament for London. And welcome to this event, which we hope will be the, the start of, of a series. Um, I, in some ways, apologise for this having been on International Women's Day, because I know there are a lot of other things that we could be out and doing, but we're certainly going to cover that dimension um, in our discussions this evening. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming, and I'd also like to uh, thank very much the High Commission for Bangladesh for being represented here tonight. So I'm very grateful indeed for that. The background to this was uh, a discussion I had with the constituents quite some time ago from somebody whose heritage is, is from India. And he said he felt that it was very important for London's different communities to know about the problems of climate change in their sort of country of background and that it was and what they could do about that and that it was also important for others in London to understand what is happening in other countries and the effect that we have. So that's the background and I'm very grateful to that constituent for that idea. In the European Parliament, one of the roles that I have is to chair the delegation for South Asia, Parliament's relations with Parliaments of various countries there. And that covers countries such as Bhutan and Nepal, where in one of our delegation visits, we actually, we didn't climb, we were taken up into the Himalayas to look at the issue of glacial lakes there and to think about the implications of what happens if they burst and what happens downstream and to develop a better understanding of what is actually happening in the mountains, the third pole. We cover Pakistan, where we've seen the impact of floods and again, their link with the mountain ranges. We cover Sri Lanka, which while there have been other problems there that we've been concentrating on, certainly issues about climate change are beginning to move up the agenda there. And it's something that as a parliament delegation, we are charged to discuss that with every government, every parliament that we meet when we're there. And we also cover the Maldives and Bangladesh, two of the lowest emitters Greenhouse, gas, um, greenhouse gases in the world, but countries that are amongst the most affected. And we were reminded when we were in Bangladesh just two weeks ago that Bangladesh has a lower emission rate than Manhattan. So when we were there in Bangladesh two weeks ago, we met a number of people. We met Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, we met the leader of the opposition, we met various ministers, and we also met parliamentary um, committee which deals with climate change and the environment. And we've agreed to further cooperation between that committee and the European Parliament, those of us interested in climate change, including people on the Environment Committee, Development Committee and elsewhere. <coughs> but I'm not an expert on these issues by any means, <coughs> so I'm extremely grateful that we have on the platform tonight genuine, real, absolute experts. Our first speaker will be um, Dr. Salman Hook, who's a senior fellow at the International Institute for Environment and Development and the former executive director of the Bangladesh Centre for Advanced Studies. We will also be hearing from Dr. Andrea Schill, who is the outgoing director general of ISIMOD the International Centre for Integrated Mountain Development, <coughs> and our previous meetings have been more in Nepal than they have been in London, where he has been explaining to Parliament delegations what we should know. I'd very much like to start by warmly welcoming Dr. Sandler. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean, and good evening, everybody. Um, I've been asked to give you a little bit of uh, a personal take on the last 20 years since Rio, given that we now are about to be celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Earth Summit held in Rio in 1992 with the Rio Plus 20. And given that I work mainly on climate change, uh, most of my take will be on the climate change issue. And also uh, a little bit about what's happening in Bangladesh on this issue. 
Uh, before I do that, though, let me give you a little bit of a, uh, a background so that you know where I'm coming from. For the last 12 years, I've been based here in London at the International Institute for Environment and Development, where I started the climate change program. And I'm now a senior fellow. I no longer run the climate change program. I'm in the process of relocating uh, back to Bangladesh, where I'm originally from, and setting up a new international center for climate change and development at a university there called the Independent University, which is a joint venture with IID in London. So I'll remain a senior fellow at IID, but I'll be seconded to Bangladesh uh, to set this up. <coughs> I'm at the moment commuting between London and Dhaka. Hopefully, I'll, I'll spend more time in Dhaka uh, fairly soon. And over the last 12 years, I've been involved in the climate change issue, mainly looking at the impacts on poor and vulnerable countries in Asia and Africa. And in the climate change uh, arena, look that the issue is impacts on vulnerable countries and what they can do about it through adaptation. So less on how to reduce emissions uh, globally, but more on how to help poor countries, poor communities deal with the inevitable and unavoidable impacts of climate change. And I've done that both in the uh, international scientific arena, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, where I've been a lead author uh, for several of their reports, as well as the policymaking arena, which is the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the annual conferences of parties of the uh, countries that meet uh, to discuss policymaking in the UNFCC, where I've been attending and particularly supporting a group of uh, vulnerable countries called the Least Developed Countries Group, which are 48 of the poorest countries in the world, most of them sub-Saharan Africa, but some in Asia, including Bangladesh, which are a caucus group within the broader group of developing countries, which is called the Group of 77 in China, and supporting the Least Developed Countries in enhancing their capabilities and ability to uh, negotiate more effectively. So what I'll do is I'll give you uh, a sort of potted history of my take on how the climate change issue has evolved over the last 20 years and where we stand now, and then a little bit about some specifics that are happening in Bangladesh. In my view, the climate change issue has gone through three what I call eras of or paradigm changes. The, the first paradigm, and, and it links very much between the science of climate change as brought to us or assessed by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and how that then gets translated into policy making, particularly in the UNFCC process. So there's a very clear link between what the IPCC reports have been saying over the years and how policy making has evolved at the global level in the UNFCC. So the first era started with the first assessment report of the IPCC, 1990, which alerted the world to the fact that we have something called global warming based on emissions of greenhouse gases, from the use of fossil fuels like coal, petroleum, and natural gas and other uh, greenhouse gases, and that if we continue at the rate that we have been doing for the last 150 years, then in the next few decades, we're looking at considerably higher temperatures, which may have very adverse impacts on human societies generally, unless we do something about it. And, and since this is a global problem, we need all the countries of the world to come together and do something. A handful of countries aren't going to do it on their own. And so in the policymaking arena, we had countries come together and, and agree on the framework convention on climate change. But the first paradigm, as I said, is very much the problem as emissions of these greenhouse gases, and hence the solution of the uh, problem was to reduce those emissions. In the climate change jargon, we call that mitigation. So the first few years of the UNFCC process, including the Kyoto Protocol, focused almost exclusively at how to reduce those emissions. In the framework convention, Countries agreed to reduce their emissions, but it was on a voluntary basis. Uh, a few years later, when we had the, uh, the IPCC second report come out, that reinforced the message of the, the first report saying that emissions continue to rise despite the fact that countries have agreed to uh, voluntarily reduce their emissions. They're not really doing it. We need something stronger than a voluntary agreement. And we then had the Kyoto Protocol uh, in 1997, where we had targets set for the rich countries, the developed countries, for them to reduce their emissions by a certain percentage compared to their 1990 levels by 2012. So 2012 is like the critical year which marks the end of the first commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol. But all of that is within the paradigm of the problem being emissions and the solution being reducing emissions through mitigation. Uh, the third assessment report of the IPCC came out in 2001 
And for the first time, it alerted the world to the fact that despite promises to reduce emissions, emissions continue to grow. And that a certain degree of temperature rise is now unavoidable and inevitable, mainly due to the lags in the physical system. So when we emit a ton of uh, carbon dioxide today, it isn't going to warm the atmosphere for another decade or possibly even two decades. So we have built up into the atmosphere a, a warming that is now, over the next 10, 20 years, inevitable and unavoidable. In other words, if we were to reduce our emissions to zero today, the next 20 years' worth of warming won't be affected at all. It will get hotter. So we now have to deal with what are we going to do about that. And in the climate change arena in the, in the Framework Convention, we have a, a second paradigm coming, which is dealing with the unavoidable and inevitable impacts of climate change through adaptation. We're going to just have to deal with that. There's a, a corollary to that message from the IPCC in the third assessment report, which said that not only do we have to do adaptation, these impacts are going to fall disproportionately on poorer countries and poorer communities. Even in rich countries, it's the poorer communities that are going to be affected, but by and large, poor countries in the tropics, developing countries, least developed countries being one of the most vulnerable groups, are going to be affected much more than the richer countries are. And hence, we now had a connection between the issue of climate change and development. People who are interested in development, either at the global level or at the national level, in developing countries who hitherto had seen climate change as an environmental problem, as a global problem, as something that was going to happen in the long term, had nothing to do with poverty on the ground, began to realize that it is going to affect poor people and that if we want to help poor people, then we have to understand <coughs> climate change, what it's going to do, and then how are we going to help them to adapt. So we have a whole slew of new actors coming into the climate change arena, development practitioners, NGOs like Oxfam and others, uh, governments at the national level in developing countries beginning to deal with climate change as an impacts and adaptation issue rather than just purely as a mitigation or reducing emissions issue. And this has grown over time. We now have very strong engagement by many developing countries. In fact, one of the positive outcomes from my point of view of the uh, Copenhagen uh, summit where we didn't get the agreement that we had hoped, but the fact that there were all over a hundred heads of state, including Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina, um, whom Jim just mentioned, the fact that they went to Copenhagen and participated there, they all came back totally uh, enthused with the issue of climate change. They all felt this is a very important issue that we need to be doing a lot more on. And you then started getting, and, and increasingly have got now, a much higher political profile for climate change in many of these developing countries than they had before uh, that event. And so, as I said, it has taken hold in the development community in, in all developing countries, some more than others, and I'll talk a little bit about Bangladesh, which I think is perhaps leading in this respect in a few moments. So the second paradigm around 2001, third assessment report, talks about adaptation. Now we have the development community, development and climate change on adaptation, particularly vulnerable countries and poverty being very closely linked and a lot more people working on it. Then about a decade later, around 2009, Copenhagen and around that time, um, we had the, the fourth assessment report came out in 2007. And what it said were two things. Firstly, it said that the emissions, the mitigation strategy has to be ramped up. The rate at which we are trying to reduce our emissions is simply not going to be good enough. We are headed for a very significant temperature rise, and unless we reduce emissions fairly rapidly in the next decade or so, then in the long term, in the 50 to 100 year period, we're looking at very large temperature rises in the order of four degrees plus. Um, and that in the, in the near term, in the next decade or two, we're going to have to ramp up our efforts at adaptation. And that it isn't any longer just about adaptation in poor countries being affected, even rich countries are going to be affected. And they're going to have to start thinking about adaptation. And, and more recently, we have seen countries in Europe, including the UK, uh, developing adaptation plans uh, as well. Um, in the UNFCC process, what this led to was uh, at the 13th Conference of Parties, the Bali Action Plan, which gave the countries uh, two years to agree a post-2012 agreement, which was hoped, it was hoped would be agreed in Copenhagen by the 15th Conference of Parties. But basically, the Bali Action Plan, the architecture of the Bali Action Plan, lays the grounds for what this new agreement will be. There are four building blocks, the two central building blocks. One remains mitigation but a much stronger mitigation than the one we had in Kyoto, which includes the large developing countries like China, 
India and Brazil who were exempted from the first commitment period of Kyoto. And a second building block which was not there before in Kyoto, which is adaptation. It's now central and a major building block of the Bali Action Plan. And then there are two what are often called cross-cutting building blocks. One of them is technology, technology transfer. We'll need that for both mitigation and for adaptation. And the, the final one covers mitigation, adaptation, and technology. It's money. We're going to have, need money for mitigation, money for adaptation, and money for technology transfer. And money often is the glue that holds everything else together. If there isn't going to be money, then the other things don't happen. Um, this, this is the agreed structure. What we didn't get in Copenhagen was the agreement on, on the actual uh, uh, legal form that people, uh, countries could sign up to. And since Copenhagen, what we've had is a sort of picking up the pieces. We, we, in Copenhagen, we had the view that it was an all or nothing approach. If, if nothing was agreed until everything was agreed, and because everything wasn't agreed, nothing was agreed. Uh, since then, in Cancun, the year later, and Durban, a year after that, uh, there's been a much more pragmatic attitude of saying, let's agree what we can agree, and postpone and, and, and leave what we can't agree to later, which is a much less ambitious goal, but at least it's more realistic. So in Cancun, we have the Cancun Agreement, and in Durban, we have now the Durban Platform, which takes some of the threads of the climate change issue forward. Uh, there's the adaptation <coughs> issue that has been resolved and, and is going forward. Um, issues relating to te technology transfer have gone forward. Some financing is now on the table. There's something called fast track finance of $30 billion over three years, and then a potential $100 billion a year from 2020 with the Green Climate Fund. So some bits of the puzzle have been uh, agreed. <coughs> The bigger bits remain on mitigation, what kinds of targets, and, and the ambition and the legally binding instruments. These, we hope in the next few years, perhaps by 2015, may be resolved. But it, it, we are certainly um, backpedaling on a lot of this. So let me just make two more points and then I'll conclude. The first one is what I perceive as the, what I would call the third paradigm of, of climate change, which I don't have a particular date from which it starts, but it started over the last few years which is a reframing of the issue not, no longer in terms of either emissions of greenhouse gases and reducing them or impacts on poor people and helping them to adapt, but one of justice. It's about an issue that is caused, a problem that is caused by and large by the rich, be they rich countries or rich people even in poor countries, and the people that are going to suffer the consequences of this are poor. Poor people in poor countries and even poor people in rich countries. And that's a fundamental injustice. That's not that. And more and more in the general public, in the lay public, particularly in the South in developing countries, that's the framing that is used for dealing with this problem. It's one of injustice. One problem caused by the rich, poor are going to suffer, that's not right, we need to do something about it. And it doesn't really matter about mitigation adaptation as far as they're concerned. It's about fundamental rights, human rights, so one group of people uh, affecting adversely another group of people, and that is not something that we want to have happen. And increasingly you have now human rights groups and, and other security issues getting tied to climate change uh, as well. And, and I think that's a very significant change because it brings in a lot more uh, people into this issue because the, the moral issue of injustice is something that many more people can relate to than purely the environmental bits of mitigation and adaptation. How that will pan out in the future, I'm not quite sure, but it's something that I think engages the public much better than talking about mitigation. And so let me now move on a little bit, and, and I'll conclude with this section on what's happening in Bangladesh. In, in Bangladesh, I've, as I said, I've been working in developing countries, particularly in Africa and Asia, for the last dozen years or so. And I, I, as, as I said, I've seen <coughs> over this time a, a much greater awareness of the issue of climate change across the board uh, in these countries. But nowhere uh, has it been as, as fast and as, as great as in Bangladesh. In Bangladesh now, you can talk to a rickshaw puller and he'll talk to you about climate change. If it's raining, he'll talk about climate change. If it's hot, he'll say it's climate change. There are workshops going on in climate change every day in Dhaka city, somewhere or the other. The, the whole country is seized with this issue like I've never seen before. That's good, it's both a good thing and a bad thing. On the, on the one hand, there's a high level of awareness. On the other hand, <coughs> the awareness is not necessarily uh, scientifically based, so a lot of uh, uh, misinformation attached to it. So the, the trick now for the country is going to be transforming that high level of awareness of the issue into knowledge about how to solve the problem, how to tackle it. Uh, 
And on that front, uh, I think Bangladesh is also doing some very interesting things. Um, in the last few years, uh, the, the country carried out an exercise uh, and came up with something called the, uh, the Bangladesh Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan, which has six pillars uh, of, of actions. Interestingly, most of them are to do with adaptation because Bangladesh is a very vulnerable country, but one of them is on mitigation. And, and the view is that even though Bangladesh is not a big emitter, as Keen said, they should do what they can and they intend to do what they can. So they are committed to doing mitigation as well as adaptation. But the focus is mainly on adaptation. And uh, a couple of years ago, this was just before Copenhagen, when this plan was uh, developed by national experts and the government together with their own resources. Uh, and it was presented to the cabinet. And the finance minister at that time uh, was very taken with this. And he said, if this is such an important issue for us, why are we waiting for external resources to do something about it? And he allocated in the national budget $50 million equivalent in Bangladesh currency to implementing the climate change strategy and action plan. So Bangladesh has a budget line now for climate change to implement its own climate change strategy and action plan. At the same time, they made an appeal to um, uh, rich countries to contribute to uh, doing the same thing, to put money into the pot to implement the climate change strategy, but they put their own resources in. And then, interestingly enough, um, soon after that, we had an election, and uh, we now have uh, uh, the Awami League uh, in power under uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, who didn't very much like the previous government, and, and they overturned a lot of the policies of the previous government, except this one. On climate change, as, as Jean says, there's a, a, a solid consensus across the political divide, which is a very heavy divide in Bangladesh. The, the two parties that uh, don't really like each other or see eye to eye on many things at all, but on climate change, they do. And the new government endorsed the climate change strategy and action plan with a slight tweaking of it. And the new finance minister, in his last two budgets, has put in $100 million each year. So Bangladesh <coughs> has put in now $250 million of its own money into implementing its own climate change strategy and action plan, which, as I said, is a, you know, a, a wide variety of actions done by government, non-government actors. So there's a lot happening in the country. And at the same time, as I said, there's, they've set up something called the Multi-Donor Trust Fund, which is called the Climate Resilience Fund, where uh, international donors, including the UK, have put money in the order of about 150 million, both of which funds fl are funding the same national strategy and action plan, which is, I think, another a uh, good example in that normally what would happen with donor countries coming in and trying to help would be each country, the UK, Denmark, or whichever countries there were, would be coming in and setting up their own programs of work. In this case, they're pooling the funds, they're putting the money in the pot, and all the money is going to implement the same national strategy and action, so they're not having to do parallel exercises as much of aid money tends to do in the past. So there are a number of very good examples happening in Bangladesh. I wouldn't say they're out of the woods, but I, I would say that they are moving up a learning curve uh, very, very rapidly. And uh, I'll conclude by saying that one of the reasons why I'm relocating there and setting up this new international center there is to be able to share that learning that Bangladesh is doing as it moves up this learning curve with the rest of the world, not just with other developing countries or least developed countries, but even with the rich countries, because all countries are going to have to face the impacts of climate change sooner rather than or later. Bangladesh is facing it sooner, and what they learn in order to deal with it is going to be valuable for everybody, including the rich. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.